In the last couple of episodes of this series, Ancient Egypt, Dynasty by Dynasty, we've seen how Egypt was divided up during the time frame that we today call the Second Intermediate Period. The most powerful polity during this time was that ruled by a group of kings that Egyptologists today identify as the 15th dynasty, better known by most in modern times as the Hyksos. They were of Canaanite origin, and though they eventually claimed to be the sons of Ra, like all Egyptian kings, they didn't control the entire country. The southern part, Upper Egypt, still remained outside of their grasp. By the time of the Hyksos king, Kian, who ruled over a wealthy and militarily formidable kingdom from his cosmopolitan capital of Avaris in the Nile Delta, the areas of southern Egypt below the city of Abydos had become destitute and all but completely isolated, both economically and politically. Kian was succeeded by Apepi, who taunted the kings of the south based in Thebes, and who were a new group of rulers, making up what would later be recognized as Egypt's 17th dynasty, as well as a contender for the throne of Egypt. While the kings of the 15th dynasty better known as the Hyksos, were taking the northern part of Egypt to great heights not seen since the glory days of the Middle Kingdom, a new line of rulers, who historians would eventually classify as the 17th dynasty, was also gaining influence in the areas surrounding the city of Thebes. How they came to replace the preceding 16th dynasty, also based in Thebes, isn't clearly stated in any known text. but. There are several hypotheses and theories as to how this may have come about. One is that the last king of the 16th dynasty may not have had an heir, and this allowed another, perhaps more influential noble house and its leaders to assume the position of the top job in Thebes. Another possibility is that there may have been a power struggle that brought about the violent overthrow of the 16th dynasty, though as of now, Little, if any conclusive evidence, has been uncovered to support this. Or it could have just been that Rahotep, who most Egyptologists today believe was the first king of what became the 17th dynasty, simply married a daughter from the preceding ruling house and became Thebes's ruler that way. One very plausible and somewhat popular explanation is that the Hyksos, on one of their raids in the south, defeated the last king of the 16th dynasty and ended his line, after which they either appointed a new Theban family to rule on their behalf as their vassal, or created the conditions for that family to seize power. This makes sense because it seems that the first few rulers of the 17th dynasty did not have any quarrel or open hostility towards the Hyksos kings in Avaris. Despite this, the first four rulers of the 17th dynasty held little real power in Upper Egypt, and likely had to be content with sharing what they had with other influential families and rivals for the throne of Thebes that may have popped up after the collapse of the 16th dynasty. However, by the reign of Nubkepera Intef, many of them seemed to have rallied around, or were coerced, to support the now firmly established family that we today know as the 17th dynasty. One document from the city of Gebtu, just over 40 kilometers north of Thebes, outlines a ruling by Nubkepera Intef which dismisses a certain Minhotep, who was one of the bureaucrats from the temple of the god Min. The king's verdict reads, Have him cast out from the temple of my father, Min. Have him driven out of that temple office from sun to sun and generation to generation and hurled to the ground. His provisions are to be taken away, so that his name is not remembered in this temple, as is done to one like him who rebels. The reason for such a harsh verdict isn't given, but Minhotep's replacement 
was Min Emhat, the mayor of Gebtu, who also just happened to have been a fervent supporter of Nubkepera Intef. This has led many to conclude that Minhotep wasn't dismissed for any sort of malfeasance, but simply because he may not have been deemed loyal enough or paid proper respect to his boss in Thebes. The kings of the 17th dynasty were buried at a place that's today known as Dra Abu El Naga, near the entrance of what would later become the Valley of the Kings, where most pharaohs of the New Kingdom era were laid to rest. While there's no indication that the kings of the 17th dynasty and the Hyksos were in any way friends, there also doesn't seem to have been much hostility between them either, at least at the beginning. In fact, the Nubians and their allies to the south of Thebes were the greater threat. According to an autobiography found in the tomb of a 17th dynasty governor from El Kab named Sobeknacht, Nubians had ransacked and plundered many of the villages along Egypt's southern frontier. Though they were eventually pushed back to beyond the Nile's first cataract, it's recorded that the Egyptians suffered many losses. Tensions between the Thebans and the Hyksos flared up during the reign of Sekenenre Tau, whose time on the Theban throne most Egyptologists date to between 1558 to 1554 BC. We don't know exactly what the initial conflict was about, but a piece of Egyptian literature called The Quarrel of Apepe and Sekenenre, written a few centuries later during Egypt's 19th dynasty, presents at least one rather bizarre reason. Hippos. It came to pass that the land of Egypt was in misery, and there was no lord functioning as a proper king of the time. It happened that King Sekenenre was ruler of the southern city, and misery was in the city of the Asiatics, while Prince Apepe was in Avaris. And the entire land paid tribute to him, delivering their taxes in full, as well as bringing all good produce of Egypt. Now, as for King Apepe, it was his wish to send an inflammatory message to King Sekenenre, prince of the southern city. And many days after this, King Apepe had the high officials of his palace summoned, and he proposed to them that a messenger should be sent to the prince of the southern city with a complaint concerning the river, but he was unable to compose it himself. Thereupon his scribes and wise men and high officials said, O Sovereign, our Lord, demand that there be a withdrawal from the lagoon of Hippopotami, which is in the east of the city, because they don't let sleep come to us, either in the daytime or at night, for the noise of them is in our ears. And King Apepe answered them, saying, I shall send a messenger to the prince of the southern city, that we may assess the power of the god who is with him as protector. He does not rely upon any god that is in the entire land except Amun-Ra, king of the gods. The rest of the text tells us that upon receiving the Hyksos messenger, Sekenenre deliberated with his advisors as to what his response should be. And just as we're about to learn what happens next, the text is cut off lost for eternity, that is, until a copy of the complete text can be found. Though we can't prove or disprove the veracity of the story, most Egyptologists would agree that the quarrel of Apepe and Sekenenre is not a historical document, but a work of fiction. Whether due to hippos, high taxes, Egyptian nationalism, or something else, Sekenenre Tau went to war with his northern neighbor, he first established a forward operating base across the river from Gebtu at a site that today is known as Der el Balas. Both fortress and palace for the royal family, the complex he constructed there sat atop a hill with commanding views of the entire Nile Valley, the perfect place from which to defend positions further south. From his new command center, 
Second and Rei Tao launched waves of attacks against Hyksos' positions further north, apparently leading his men from the front and engaging his enemies in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But in the end, he was killed, perhaps from a blow from behind while on his chariot, or executed as a prisoner by an axe to his forehead or a dagger to his neck. Forensic experts examining his mummified remains have differing opinions of exactly how he died. X-rays of his mummy also show that the normal practice of removing the brain in preparation for mummification was not carried out, and that the subsequent embalming procedures were poorly done, indicating that the whole process had been rushed. One explanation for this is that the Hyksos were in hot pursuit of the retreating Theban army, and so a formal burial with all of the appropriate rites and rituals may not have been possible. The next in line for the throne of Thebes was Sekenenre's son, Kamos, sometimes also pronounced Kemose. There was a heavy burden on his head, to say the least. If there had been a detente between the Hyksos and the Thebans before, it was now over. With the brutal death of Sekenenre Tao, the Thebans had passed the point of no return. There could be no peace with the Asiatic enemy. There was also the very real possibility that if Apepi and the Hyksos overran Thebes and the rest of Upper Egypt, then for the first time in the country's recorded history, Egypt might be ruled in its entirety by non-Egyptians. This, to a proud man such as Kamos, was unacceptable. Much of what we know about Kamos's fight against the Hyksos and his efforts to take Middle and Lower Egypt comes from two monuments which were found within the great temple complex at Karnak. One stela tells us how a distressed Kamos was sitting with his court officials to discuss their next course of action against the enemy to the north. His majesty spoke in his palace to the council of officials, which was in his following. To what effect do I perceive it, my might, while a ruler is in Avaris and another in Kush? I, sitting joined with an Asiatic and a Nubian, each man having his own portion of this Egypt sharing the land with me. There is no passing him as far as Memphis, the water of Egypt. He has possession of Hermopolis, and no man can rest, being deprived by the levies of the Setiu. I shall engage in battle with him, and I shall slit his body, for my intention is to save Egypt, striking the Asiatics. Camos's council, though, was not convinced, and favored a more conciliatory approach towards Apepe. According to the stela, The officials of his council then spoke in unison. We are content with our part of Egypt. Elephantine is firmly in our control, and the middle section is with us as far as Kusai. The finest of the fields are plowed for us, and our cattle graze in the delta. Emmer is sent for our swine. Our cattle are not taken away. Apepi possesses the land of the Asiatics, but we possess Egypt. Should one who acts against us come, then we shall act against him. But Kamos neglected their advice. These were councilmen, who though they might have been loyal to him, were not warriors. They didn't seek glory, and were not concerned about Egypt's honor but rather only about having enough stability to preserve their estates and lofty government titles. Kamos vowed that he would venture north and rid Egypt of its Hyksos occupiers. The stela tells us that he told his advisors the following. Dividing the land is not tolerable for me. I shall sail northwards to do battle with the Asiatics, and success will come to pass and the entire land will say, The ruler within Thebes, Kamos the Valiant, is the protector of Egypt. But before this could happen, he had to solidify his border with Nubia to prevent future raids into southern Egypt. And so, during his second year on the throne, 
Camos led an army into Nubia and the land of Wawat, which he was able to take without much resistance. His men easily took the old Middle Kingdom fortress of Buhin, many of whose defenders were of Egyptian origin and were willing to immediately defect to a ruler who was one of their own. Camos then appointed Teti, one of his most trusted men, as the viceroy to administrate the newly acquired areas of Nubia on his behalf. With Nubia pacified, at least for now, Camos turned his gaze north to take on the Hyksos. Histila tells us how his men raided towns loyal to the 15th dynasty, including one known as Neferusi, whose population he claims to have devastated. By the command of Amun, astute of council, I sailed north to my victory to drive back the Asiatics, my courageous army in front of me like a flame of fire with the bowmen of the Magi, upland of our encampment, ready to seek out the Asiatics and destroy their dwellings. The eastern desert lands and the western desert lands provided with their fat and my army being supplied with produce from their dwellings. I sent a mighty patrol of Magi to confront Teti, son of Pepi, within Neferusi without letting him flee and I confined the Asiatics who were defying Egypt, for he had made Neferusi a nest for the Asiatics. It was with my heart at ease that I spent the night in my boat. When dawn came, I was upon him as if I were a falcon, and when the time of midday meal had come, I had driven him back and had destroyed his walls and slain his people. I had his women go down to the shore, as lions are with their prey, so was my army with their servants, cattle, milk, fat, and honey. In dividing up their property, their hearts were joyful. The region of Neferusi was in retreat. During the campaign, Camos's men intercepted a letter from Apepe that was meant for the king of Kush. He proposed that they become allies against Camos, and that upon their victory, divide the conquered territories of Upper Egypt amongst themselves. Another stila of Camos tells us the following. For it was on the upland way of the oasis that I captured his messenger going south to Kush with a written letter. I found on it saying in writing, From the ruler of Avaris, son of Ra, a Pepe. Greetings to the son of the ruler of Kush. Why have you arisen as ruler without letting me know? Do you see what Egypt has done against me? The ruler who is in it, Camos the Valiant, given life, attacks me on my soil, although I have not attacked him in the manner of all he has done against you, for he chooses the two lands to afflict them my land and yours, and he has devastated them. Come northward, do not flinch, for he is here with me, and there is no one who can stand up to you in this part of Egypt. See, I will not give him away until you arrive. Then we shall divide the towns of Egypt, and both our fine lands shall be in joy. Camos took the letter requesting aid from Kush as a sign that Apepi was weak and couldn't defend his own territory without help. And so, the Stila tells us, the king of Thebes marched further north and reached the outskirts of Avaris, where he claims to have drunk the wine from Pepi's own vineyards, carried off his women to his boats, and plundered Hyksos storehouses filled with gold, silver, lapis lazuli, and the like. We have to remember, though, that these are Camos' accounts written on monuments to commemorate and record his victories against a hated enemy. And so naturally, there's some bias. But even so, his stories on each stila give us a good idea of the armed conflict between the two dynasties, as well as Camos' efforts to seize Middle and Lower Egypt from the Hyksos. Though he may have devastated large parts of the delta, Camos could not take Avaris, and eventually 
he and his men marched back to Thebes to celebrate their great victories over Apepi. They would rest, resupply, and continue the war the following year. At least, that was the plan. Camos unexpectedly died a few months later, with the throne passing to his younger brother, Ehmos, the second son of Sekenenre Tao. Ehmos, though, was too young at the time to assume his duties as king, and so his mother ruled as regent until he came of age. That would still take about 10 years, during which the two sides, the 15th dynasty of Avaris and the 17th dynasty of Thebes, would fight to what basically amounted to a stalemate. Though at the time of boy, Ehmos would go on to become one of Egypt's greatest and most celebrated kings, and usher in a new golden age, and arguably the most famous period of Egyptian history, the era of the New Kingdom. That and so much more will be in the next episode of Ancient Egypt, Dynasty by Dynasty. Stay tuned. Thanks so much for watching, I really appreciate it. I'd also really like to thank Grandkeck69, Yap de Graf, Pasta Frola, Michael Lewis, Daniel Allen, Wanex TV, Robert Morgan, Frank, Tim Lane, Sebastian Hurtado Correa, Michael Trudell, Leader Titan, Micah G, John Scarberry, Andrew Bomer, Monty Grimes, Franz Robbins, Brendan Redman, Baridun Dadachanji, Jimmy Darawala, Anahita Debu, Gulistan Debu, Sher Cam, Farhad Kama, and all of the channel's patrons on Patreon for helping to support this and all future content. Check out the benefits to being a Patreon member, and if you'd like to join, feel free to click the link in the video description. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as continue to listen to special audio programs on the History with Sai podcast. Thanks again, and stay safe.